Who knew that the economic crisis was playing out so just markedly with mall Santas? So what is the solution to U.S. economic problems like this jobs crisis? Okay, we often have guests on who talk about sound money or regulations, but how about an entire new, not just economic system, but social system too. It sounds obviously very radical, but that is just what Peter Joseph of the Zeitgeist Movement is arguing for, and he is going to explain how and why exactly that would work. Peter, it's so nice to have you on the show. I'll just get right to it. So we have guests on this show who advocate for different uh, solutions to the criticisms of the current economic system, from debt jubilees to better regulations to the private industry to a sounder money. Now, you argue for just getting rid of free market capitalism as we know it and completely overhauling the social system. Why do you think that's the solution? Well, as all well and good as those things are, and thank you, Lauren, for having me, the real crutch here is the structural flaws and the psychological flaws that this system creates. So the unemployment crisis, the debt crisis, the public health crisis, the poverty crisis, uh, the energy crisis that's looming and the immense social destabilization you're seeing are actually systemic causes of the fatal flaws of this system at the core logic. Now, I can expand on any one of those topics that you like. If you take, for example, what you just covered in this broadcast, the unemployment crisis. Okay. The unemployment crisis is really driven by technology. That's very important for people to understand because, unfortunately, many aren't talking about this. We have an exponential increase in information technology coupled with invention, material invention in manufacturing and all the other sectors, the service sectors, design revolutions that are happening with artificial intelligence, eliminating the necessity for human occupations. And it's exponentially increasing. And increasing more rapidly as this decline occurs as well because it's more affordable for corporations to automate. They don't have to pay insurance and vacations. If you look closely, this is the systemic element. Does that mean technology is bad? No. It means that human evolution is moving in a certain path that is literally making obsolete the current social system in that attribute that I just mentioned. But I'll pause there and let you continue. Thank you. And we'll get more into this. To stick to what you brought up, which is jobs, which we were talking about, certainly you can talk about the technological component of job loss. But let me get to another one. Uh, what about just, for example, the industry of construction in this country, which we saw kind of get totally decimated with the housing bubble, which popped. And this gets to the issue of debt, which I know is a, an issue that you talk about. Can you talk about the role of debt and the limitations of it in our monetary system? Well, sure. Uh, you kind of have this bubble quality with debt. You notice many people talk about debt jubilee and debt forgiveness now. In fact, I heard one economist say that we should just forgive debt every 50 years. And that doesn't really address the fundamental problem, does it? Basically, we have our money produced out of debt. Money is made out of debt whether it comes from the central banks or it comes from the private banks. The private banks manipulate money, loan it at interest to people, and there's the interest component which doesn't exist in the money supply. So you have an, an infinite amount of debt increasing constantly throughout the entire world, and that is why we are in the staggering state that we're in, suffocating us on so many different levels. Just look at medical debts, look at student loan debts, look at all of the deprivation that's being caused of that. That's one side of it, which is, to my, my view, a completely sick social experiment. It's a, it's a horrible thing to do to human society to even impose this fictional element on them to impose them, which brings me to my other point, which is that debt serves as a form of, for lack of a better expression, slavery. It's an imposition of scarcity, which forces people into positions that they typically wouldn't take for their purposes of integrity or education, but they have to, and usually at less expense to the corporation. So, in a way, it's great for the corporate system on a certain level, to a certain threshold, to have many inhibited people that have no freedom to be in debt. In fact, a running joke in my community is that when you get out of college, most likely you have $80,000 worth of debt. You're ripe to be enslaved into a corporate system that doesn't have to give in to your interests or take care of you. So you argue debt is slavery. You have some other criticisms of it as well. Of course, we've seen the cost of it right now in so many of the issues that we cover every day on this show in the Eurozone crisis with public debt. That's obviously just one side of it. Uh, my question then, is this why you want to ditch the monetary system? And if so, also, how do you reward work and sacrifice that people make? 
Well, the, the removal of the monetary system, I believe, it will occur regardless of, of my intents. It's a natural evolution of human society. All the mechanisms that kept the system in place are phasing itself out by default, and the social destabil destabilization that's on the horizon, I don't even have to do anything, I'm just trying to help, is going to cause some type of change. And I hope, and the people that I work with, we hope it will move into a sane direction and not something equally as sinister as what we've been seeing for the past, basically, 20 generations. But, but now, the is issue of incentive is a common... Oh, supporting argument common supporting argument with respect to how people defend the free market system they say well if people don't have a direct material incentive to work hence reward that carrot stick if you will then they won't have any initiative to do so the first thing I would say is that scientifically a lot of research has been done to show that when it comes to creative interests people are not motivated by money in fact money seems to be inhibited inhibiting people's creative effects. It's only mechanical operations, like working at a factory line or waiting tables, things that can easily be automated, by the way, if we applied our technology, that people need that reward because it's so mundane. The true ability, the true, the best resource on the planet is the human mind and to free that mind to enable it to be creative and that's the beauty of our technological evolution at this point. On a second level, noting that scientific validity, that incentive is not always the case for people to be operational, we have other incentives in society that are not directly material, that are very, very rewarding, that if people broaden their horizon, they would see. For example, the incentive to be able to walk out your home and not be worried about someone robbing you because they live in a deprived environment, pulling out a gun and taking your resources, putting all those locks on our doors. Most of the crime we see in the world is related to money, one way or another, and deprivation through the monetary system. Another incentive is the removal of war, the removal of poverty. Imagine having the satisfaction of knowing there aren't one billion people starving on this planet. There is a deeply social element in us that is coming to fruition. It has to for our survival. I believe that our personal interest must become social interest. It has to. It really is already there, but we just don't know it yet. We don't think about it that way. And until that happens, we have a lot of big things on the horizon. One final point I'll say about incentive. How about this as a classic example? We have all sorts of immense military revolutions happening right now. They're going to make the atomic bomb look like a catapult, a Roman catapult. What's going to happen when we have these advanced technologies and the immature society we do now based based on this far farce social Darwinism, this tribal mentality, this sovereign war mentality, everyone fighting amongst themselves with the assumption we can't get along. What's going to happen when we have the advanced technologies that can be pulled off the shelf through, say, molecular engineering that can wipe out whole continents at a whim? Mm -hmm. This is a very real thing. In the words of Albert Einstein, our technology has exceeded our humanity. So it's very important that our values come in line. And that's explicit to our new socially conscious revolution that and, has and to come from the basis of the economic and system. Peter there is so much more I want to get to because you're, you have so many interesting points of view that I want to get more into. And also, uh, since we last spoke, uh, Occupy Wall Street has happened, which we, where we see people protesting the economic system on the streets of the U.S. So I want to talk about more of these things. We're going to go to a quick break, but we will be back with director and filmmaker Peter Joseph. All right, with Occupy Wall Street all over the nation, we have seen people come out onto the streets to protest the economic system itself. And director and filmmaker Peter Joseph is one who advocates for a total overhaul. So we are going to get more into what he thinks of this movement and also uh, what he thinks of changes to the economic system. So, Peter, let's get back into this because, as I said, Occupy Wall Street is on the streets protesting the economic system. It's also a leaderless movement. I'm curious how you see, if you see them as being, having their intentions in the right place. Uh, intentions, absolutely. Uh, but until answers are proposed, until people get together and to think about a solution, uh, not much is going to be accomplished, unfortunately. It's an awareness protest movement. It's really important what they're doing. I think it's really another systemic outgrowth of destabilization. I've been expecting this type of thing to happen for a long time. Um, Occupy Wall Street and the global Occupy movement, which is really the most important attribute of it, because this isn't, this isn't just about Wall Street, this isn't just about the United States. It is really about the total global financial system and the inherent flaws of the market system. Even though many people in the movement don't even discuss those issues, they just are they're expressing their angst, though, and rightly so. What I would like to state, though, is that the 1% are not something to be demonized, per se. The 1% are simply the best game players in this game strategy that's been generated. Mm -hmm. The 99% have let the 1% 
come to their place as easily as anything because the 99% basically have been supporting all the mechanisms that enable the 1%. The system is based on a structural classism. It's, it's always in favor of the wealthy. I don't mean that just from lobbying and government intervention. The right. very basis of the structure from the bankings and the loans and the interest system really supports that. So if the, if the Occupy movement really wants to get down to brass tacks, they're really going to have to start addressing these root issues that I talk about and that my movement talks about and many other talk about as well. And then think about what the solution is. I really believe in the Buckminster Fuller notion that it's not about fighting some system anymore. It's about building a new design that makes the other one obsolete and getting the public to understand it, and then the game is basically over. And it's kind of evolution that you talk about, but I'm just really curious kind of how you do that and how long you see that needing to take, because I don't know if you saw the Black Friday videos of people attacking each other for $2 waffle makers. I'm going to play a tiny montage for our audience. I'm sure you can imagine from the noise is what's going on in them. It sounds like riots. It looks a little like riots. Unfortunately, it's people clamoring for video games. I wouldn't want to get between them and their video games. How do you get between them and their video games, and how long is that going to take? Yeah, good question. Um, I'd like to point out that before World War II, consumption in America was half of what it is now per person. The, the ravenous consumption mentality has really been imposed on culture by advertising, and uh, it's very important people see that. So when you see that, that aberrant behavior of such, it's really it's a cultural anomaly. We've, we need that in the market system to enable consumption to be as rampant as possible, to keep this ep infinite growth paradigm going, unfortunately. So how do you, how do you change that issue? Issue? Is that your question? How do yeah. you get people to uh, see the light? Absolutely. Well, you Put know, down the video games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as though those are life supporting elements anyway. Exactly. Uh, but nevertheless, you have to. There's a, a massive educational paradigm that I can't, uh, I can't talk about enough. The, the social breakdown of society is going to open minds. This is the biosocial pressure that has basically caused every major shift in human society. The problems that are on the horizon are going to slowly get everyone to step back and say, what do we do now? And that's where I think the importance of, of you and everyone that's in, aware of this, we have to get together and show people what a solution can be and get them on board and get a mass movement, if you will, to enable it to come forward. Forward. Now, that sounds very simplistic and it's an overgeneralization, but it's not going to happen through government policy. Governments are far too interlocked today into corporate, the corporate institution. Governments are corporations. All the U.S. government is is a parent corporation of all these subsidies known as the, basically the industry central. That's really all the U.S. government does. It's funded, supported, and regulated by corporations. It always was, by the way. This isn't some anomaly that occurred. It's just the nature of the game. We shouldn't expect anything less. All so right, Peter. I think it's a mass grassroots movement. Mass right. grassroots movement. Sounds like there's going to be a yes. lot of movement needed in order to get to where you're saying we need to be. So I certainly credit you for, uh, you know, trying and for coming on our show and talking all about this. That's Peter Joseph, sure. uh, filmmaker and director. He's uh, with the Zeitgeist Movement. Thanks so much, Peter.